everybody. So I'm back today, and I'm back with an episode that um, may turn out to be a little bit of a series, or may end with this one, but I'm calling it Outside In, and it's re in regards to Warhammer Fantasy, a la Age of Sigmar, a la Mordheim. Um, but mostly just more Warhammer Fantasy in general. Um, I could have called this part two to a video that I recently did where I just titled it Warhammer Fantasy question mark. Um, for those of you that want to know a little bit of my background with Warhammer Fantasy, um, which basically there isn't a background, um, but I'd have a video about I talk about why I'm interested in it now. I'll post that in the description of this video, uh, the link to that other video. But just for the purposes of this um, video, if you haven't watched that, just know that I don't really know what I'm talking about when it comes to Warhammer Fantasy. Um, what I'd like to sort of start the video off with just as a preface is just I want to have um, a little bit of a discussion. Um, I hope that will elicit some good conversation um, in the comments regarding Warhammer Fantasy. But for folks that are really into Warhammer Fantasy and have played it historically, um, take this as a newcomer's perspective from listening to the community on the current state of the game and going into Age of Sigmar given all of the rumors and everything that have been said. Um, I'd like to just, and, and, and it's not just about the new stuff, it's just I want to give my perspectives of what I've seen of the game, you know, because I've watched, I've dedicated probably, <laughs> probably about 10 days to two weeks of, of really thinking about um, Warhammer Fantasy um, and getting into it. And looking at various, the communities, you know, across different platforms of the that of the game. You know, YouTube, of course, being one. Others being discussion forums. Um, and so, I guess um, to start really broad, I would just say my background in fantasy, fantasy, just short as I just described in my other video, is mostly Dungeons and Dragons, perhaps um, Eldar Scrolls, going back pretty far online, um, and then also enjoying Lord of the Rings. You know, and, and when I say Dungeons and Dragons, it's not just the game. I've read lots of the novels, and, and I was, you know, playing it as a real young kid, you know, and so I, I go way back with it. Um, but have not played Warhammer Fantasy. Now, I do, I have played several editions of Warhammer 40k, one of them being Rogue Trader, uh, the first one, had a huge break and have come back and have been back for a while now, but... Um, you know, I, I, I'm an avid fan of 40k, and so just take that in, in context here, you know, in my discussion. Um, one of the things I'll just mention, too, is just when I give my opinion on this, don't take this negatively. I'm, I'm planning on actually, you know, I have a lot of good things to say, um, as well as I have some, I guess, observations that, you know, could be taken as critical. Um, take this from somebody that doesn't know what they're talking about, but does have experience in other games and likes the genre. Um, so just, you know, don't, don't take it as a, from an expert opinion, you know, on the game. Um, so when I think of fantasy, just to take a step back, I usually, it can be split so many different ways, but sword and sorcery for me the big heavyweights and the big ways to enjoy it on for me is generally like D and D on one side and Lord of the Rings on the other. Um, of course, Lord of the Rings heavily influenced D and D, um, but dungeon crawl or RPG role playing game or epic battles. Um, you can argue that both the indie and Lord of the Rings, as a, as genres, you know, um, as encompass both of those. But when I think of D and D, I think of dungeon crawling, and I think of the RPG aspect. When I think of Lord of the Rings, I think of the epic battles, um, particularly from the scenery. But at the same time, yes, there are lots of moments in Tolkien that are um, close to, you know, like dungeon crawling or just sort of adventuring that are not epic battles and interpersonal kind of 
moments between characters and things that, that are beyond that. But let's just take the movie series, just the one that really re uh, reinvigorated this Lord of the Rings in the last 10 years. And, and it's epic battles. I mean, like, that's what so much time was spent on. Um, getting back to Warhammer Fantasy, you know, and coming from that perspective, um, well, I, I really like um, the RPG, the adventuring aspect. I like the look of the epic battles, but when I think of fantasy, for me, I really like that adventuring feel. Um, you know, whether it be reading the books by, you know, um, Salvatore or, or whatever. I mean, I just really like that. Um, and so I, I come to looking at Warhammer Fantasy from that perspective. Now, so when I first looked at Warhammer Fantasy being played in the regular game, I'll be honest, I, I wasn't really that into it, um, watching it. Um, I guess what I saw was mass battles, but when I first looked at it, it just didn't really look like mass battles. So like when I look at Lord of, when I think of Lord of the Rings and they when they pan back, I mean it's fields of troops and Although, when you look up close and you see them marching, they are rank and file, it doesn't really look like that when they fight. I mean, like, like when the orcs come in, like, it's a horde, right, coming in. Um, yeah, like, when they march up, you can see the scenes where they are rank and file, kind of like what it looks like in Warhammer Fantasy, you know, when you have the big games and you have the guys in blocks. But when I think of even goblins, like, and you think of Lord of the Rings, I don't think of ordered troops in rank and file, like, I think of mass chords and things like that. And um, and so it didn't really give me the feel um, of it. And now, because I come from the context of playing 40k, I had um, trouble even when watching it because it, it is strategic, like in the way you m do your movement and your rank and file units. And I can see the wheeling and just how, like, you know, people's brains are working is how they're going to get in and, like, you know, avoid the charge of your enemy, but maybe try to maximize your charge. And even though there's very little terrain on the board for most of the games I saw, you know, you're trying to maximize how you're going to use that terrain, you know, as avoiding a bottleneck, etc. But at the same time, um, I typically see more movement in, like, let's say 40k. Um, and so when I saw like two bricks or like of those units coming together and then there was just a ton of dice rolling like you know yeah there's magic and there's different things but I could see there was just lots of dice rolling but then like everything sort of um, you know kind of you know um, remaining the same and so I'll just put these on camera I, I was kind of thinking of like two softballs but a softball and a baseball but for me it just kind of looked like this like I had like my one unit and then my other unit and I kind of put them together and then it's like bop, 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 rolling dice and it's like, you know, all kinds of stuff going on. And now granted, I'm new and so I don't know. I had an idea what some of that stuff was when I was watching the battle reports, but I, because I'm new, I didn't really have a good perspective. But it was just sort of weird for me to just see like no movement, but just like all this discussion and like all this dice rolling. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that and like nothing's moving. And so I'm used to quite a bit more movement of the models in playing the games that I that I play currently and so my initial turnoff was a little bit of that too I think now one of the things that I and to say in positive and just in initially looking at it is I quickly got over a little bit of that and I, I like the look of, of armies put together in rank and file I mean there's a charm and a majesty and seeing you know your huge blocks of troops lined up and coming in and rushing and like it's just that there's a an emotional uh, it evokes things emotionally to see that it like kind of from the perspective of um, getting your head into the game like from a narrative perspective or even just you know um, your imagination you know and just having like you know the hordes and coming in and so to a degree, you know, like I kind of was coming around to the idea as I was watching more and more games and, and kind of watching it. Um, and so that those were sort of my, my initial observations. Now, um, Mordheim, initially, I really liked it when looking at it and watching games because, you know, I come from that liking the idea of adventuring. And 
the skirmishing and the small troops that you create and going, you know, going through the city and having like, you know, your lord and having different objectives and gaining experience and doing all that just seemed really cool to me. I really, really liked it. Um, everything about it just seemed to be great. And, but as I watched it more and I thought about it more, um, I kind of thought I had two issues with it um, that I might have issues with. One is just terrain in the sense that it's a very specific setting. It's not like I can take my stuff from um, that I have in my box of terrain, like for just open field warfare or forests or anything, and just use this generic stuff. I mean, I use my my trees and forests for 40k, even though I made them for bolt action and um, musket and tomahawks. But I can, you know, there's lots of crossover and lots of things you can do with just an open field battle. Yeah, like, it's always good to make a barn or something like I just did that, you know, wouldn't fit for 40k as much, but would fit really great for historical, you know, and have some things to, for the game, but Mordheim is really specific. I mean, you know, like, in, in the kind of um, board that you need for it, and so if I was to go all in, and, and for Mordheim, although the the miniatures themselves would be quite low, and that's an, a, that's an appeal in some ways, um... I, would, I got around to thinking, and I was thinking that in some ways, for me to really play Mordheim in the way I'd like it, it'd probably be easier for me to just paint a Warhammer Fantasy army than to actually go through all the trouble in building the board and all the terrain. Um, some of you may disagree with me with that, but if you really compare the two of them, terrain takes a long time. There's a lot of investment um, in time. Not a, less money, more time. Um, and they're both important, you know. And so... The other, th and, and so because of that, um, part of it too is it's very specific in its, its urban fantasy warfare now in some ways. And so I don't even have my urban terrain finished for 40k, you know, let alone, like I can play lots of games just open out on the field, but I find, you know, that, that urban format's fairly specific in what you have to do to prepare for a game for it, for terrain. And so I want... I guess I'll go into this now. I was going to go into it later, but like my daughter, who who wants to play some fantasy. I mean, she's interested in elves, and particularly wood elves. And I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, like the, the the models that I like the most, and the the fluff that I'm kind of identifying with is beastmen. You know, for fantasy. And I know that there's a rumor that they may not even appear um, after Age of Sigmar. But regardless. Um, of what happens if I went that route, um, you're, how could we not play like forest and open plain tundra battles if we're playing like wood elves or elves versus beast men? Like, how could we just limit it to intercity warfare? Like, it just seems ridiculous. And so, I really would like, you know, for a skirmish option to come out in Ninth or Age of Sigmar um, that has that flexibility to allow for skirmish battles in any kind of terrain I want. So I don't have to build a Mordheim board, but also be be cool like Mordheim and, and have like a lot of the mechanics and story building and experience building aspects of it. But you know, the more I've been watching these fantasy battles, as much as I kind of was saying some criticisms of my first initial look, I'd like to be able to scale up and rank up and have some bigger battles. And some of the rumors indicate that you might be able to do multiple formations, but I kind of like that. I think it would be great to be able to build upon that initial game and then um, do either. Do an adventuring kind of format or a bigger format. Um, so I was watching one video. Um, uh, on YouTube uh, of somebody's thoughts on the rumors of um, Age of Sigmar, and I'm not gonna. It doesn't make sense to go into who it was or anything like that. It's not really that important. What, what, but what they said was, is they said that they didn't really think that fantasy was gonna go skirmish because GW already has a skirmish game, 40k, and so from a business perspective, it doesn't make sense that they would compete with 40k um, by actually creating another skirmish game. This isn't a video response to that, but I'm just going to just... I wanted to mention my thoughts on that, because I actually think exact opposite. Um, you know, 
you can ha you you can have a fast food stand that has both hamburgers and hot dogs. You might want your food fast. You might like your grease, but you still might like to try a hamburger instead of a hot dog. And that doesn't mean they're not going to offer that for you, because yeah, they are going to sell less hot dogs if they have hamburgers and hot dogs. But you know, at the end of the day, you still need to appeal to people. And really, I would be very surprised that people choose. Um, Warhammer Fantasy or Warhammer 40k based on the whether it's skirmish or larger battles um, you know that they're gonna just not play one now because you have they have another skirmish I mean it's the models and it's the background that primarily drives these games in my opinion um, so I, I, I seriously doubt that anybody's gonna cross over from 40k to fantasy and leave 40k strictly because there's a skirmish option now in fantasy and I seriously doubt people are gonna now go from fantasy to 40k if you know for any reason you know because of game mechanics that they do to fantasy um, I think it's a good time for me to talk about the community and because I, I think this ties directly into that I've interacted with a little bit and um, you know, looked into the community on both YouTube and on some of the forums for fantasy because of my interest in this recently. I'd have to say um, the YouTube community, I was surprised as to how good it is for fantasy. Um, and what I mean by that, it's actually small. I, th I get the feeling that it's small compared to the 40k community. Um, definitely smaller. And that would make sense, right? Because I think 40k is bigger as a game system in the sense of its, its um, sales and, and amount of people playing and, and things like that. Um, but because of that, it has a very personable and welcoming feel to it, the YouTubers in fantasy. Um, and I think it's great, actually. Um, I don't have a problem with the 40k community on YouTube. Actually, a lot of the folks that I, that I subscribe to and that are subscribed to my channel are part of it, and I like being a part of it. Really a lot of good channels. For 40k. It's just so big that you could really um, casually watch videos and never watch everybody's <laughs> and never even get close. Um, and so there's a, it's, it feels a little bit um, so big that, you know, it, it's sometimes a little less personal than um, when a community is a bit smaller and tight in that way. Um, the forums were interesting. Um, I... Uh, um, how can I say this? I have a limited pool here, you know, a limited, a limited N in my statistical model of what I went to, but the GW hate is alive and well in fantasy as well as for 40k. Um, and what's interesting to me is, I mean, there's a number of pro GW people on the forums and people that are just kind of don't care one way or another, just there to, are interested, but they're not there to make a point, you know, negative or positive for GW. But, the, you know, the, the, the thing about the GW hate that, that I find really interesting is that if any other game or company, in most cases, if a, a Kickstarter comes out or some small game starts and if somebody doesn't like it, they just move on. They might say, oh, you know, I don't like it for this reason. But in, in most cases, they just move on. What I really got in a lot of these Age of Sigmar rumor threads and things, what I re the feeling I really got was, and I'll try to just make the best analogy that I can, is that it's almost like um, a jaded wives or husbands club. Um, I'm not gonna, I don't want to pick on women or men here. I'm just kind of saying this in a general sense and that it, it's like um, that same jaded attitude. It's like, I'm going to be here. Um, there's a long history with the game, but they're just going to repeatedly, you know, just constantly bring up negative stuff. Um, even though there's folks there just trying to really get information or really excited about it, they're just going to be there and they're going to do that. And the thing that's funny is that, you know, it, it's all, in my opinion, it's based on an emotional investment over time. You know, these folks have an emotional anchor or attachment to the game. 
and they played it for years. They have every right to be there as much as anyone else, if not more, because they're, you know, like, as veterans. But they just, um, because of that emotional attachment for whatever disappointments, and I'm not going to say that they're not warranted, you know, to them personally or to a group, but for whatever reason, um, they have that combination where they need to be there and they also need to be jaded about everything. And so it's unfortunate um, because as a new player coming in uh, to this game, but I, you know, it, it, I see it on the 40k side too. So you know, in some ways, it's it's not you know a problem of fantasy alone, uh, but it's it's unfortunate because it kind of spoils a lot. Um, you know, I, I said that thing in the beginning about take thing, take this from somebody that is on the outside looking in, um, somebody that plays other games. Um, you can take it from somebody that's a new player potentially for for Warhammer Fantasy. Um, somebody said, or a number of people have said in repeated places that new players are what drives the, the business market for a game. Now, <laughs> as you veterans watch this and the hairs come up on the back of your neck, don't, I'm not going there. I'm not trying to say you're not important because I'm actually a veteran of other games. You know, I'm a veteran of 40k. And so when I hear that, it makes the hairs stand up a little bit on the back of my neck, too, because of how much I invest in the game I like. And I can believe that. I actually can believe from a business sense, short-term, you know, uh, public-traded company, um, business markers for the next quarter, new players are really important. I, I buy it, you know, and, and I, think it's, I, I think I believe that. Um, the only other thing I would just say, though, and this is maybe diverting from the topic of Warhammer Fantasy, but I just, veterans are really important too. And I've heard so much about how new players are important recently that I feel important to say that veterans are important too. Veterans are important, where new players are important for the short-term business goals, which short-term can mean the death in the long-term if you don't meet your short-term objectives. The veterans are really important for, for basically the intellectual product and for the license as a whole. I really think that all of your, I guess, ancillary profit that comes from areas where you're, you know, promoting your license, so books, video games, all that kind of stuff, veterans, I think, play a huge role in that area of the business. Veterans also play a huge role in the release after this release. The, the, the folks that are just going to continue to be there, hopefully promote the game, um, bring people into the game, and make it something that's not just a Kickstarter or some one-book game that comes out five years ago and then you never see it again. Because everybody's comparing everything to 40k and fantasy, you know, to Games Workshop and saying it's better. Not everybody, but you, you hear it all the time. You know, oh, the rules are horrible in 40k, look at this game, you know, look at this and look at this game. Well. At the end of the day, I play a lot of games that are great rule sets. I'm not, I'm not, I am a fanboy for 40k and to a degree Games Workshop, but I do play other games. I do enjoy other games. But one thing I'll say, and even just looking at this edition for this book for Warhammer, or even 40k, the robustness of the rules and the materials that GW produces, to me, are second to none. Um... I'm, I, I know that for tournament players, there are games that people consider to be more balanced than 40k, and I won't argue with that. Um, to me, balance is a little bit subjective, so I can't really argue either way. But it's generally accepted that there are better balanced games than 40k. Um, but particularly for a narrative player or somebody that likes to just the universe and just enjoying and having fun and playing a game and immersing myself into the game, it's hard to beat some of these Games Workshop games. And, and the reason I say that is that, you know, like even when I was playing um, my daughter a couple of weeks ago and I just had a librarian, you know, take a certain, certain psychic discipline and, you know, get, you know, um, um, a psychic power off on somebody and it's just the narrative that's created and when you look in the book and you look at all of the choices and all the different schools and all of the special rules that each of them have attached to them and all of the various rules in the game and, and the amount of depth that they put into the books I think that 
they have a product that really is um, I'm gonna say hard to beat you know I, I I think there are many companies that beat Games Workshop in certain areas of their games but when you look at the quality of the models and you go across the whole thing there's a reason why so many people are emotionally attached to these games have had a history and, and why they're the number one still I think um, and so on that note, and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get a bit of hate for saying some of that stuff, but you know what? That's the way I feel about it, and and um, I'm open to other games too. Um, I like, but I think when you look at everything as a whole and you look at the overall product, um, I feel justified in, in, in making that comment. So um, the last thing is sort of a bit of a um, a trivial piece here. Um, I guess it's maybe the second last thing. I already mentioned that I wanted to do Beastmen, and so I really hope that Beastmen actually, you know, we don't really know. I mean, they say that you're supposed to be able to use every army book in Warhammer 9 going forward, so if I was to play, to go out and, and purchase some Beastmen, um, granted that army book I hear is not that great, I primarily play for narrative play, but I do like stuff that's at least usable, and so I'm kind of sitting tight on that. I'm, I'm not actually planning on buying anything at the moment. I want to see the release. Um, some cool wizard characters and some cool barbarians or marauders or all kinds of stuff like that. That would all be right up my alley too. Um, but for whatever reason, I, I've looked at some of the artwork and, and the Beastmen sculpts and, and that just kind of spoke to me as like, yeah, that, that's where I should go. Um, ideally, that's what I would do. Um, whether I go there or not, I don't know. I, I really do hope that they don't drop that from the rich background that I'm seeing in the Warhammer game. I think I've taken this... If you notice, I've been a little all over the place. I've been a bit scattered in my thoughts on whether to get into this or not. Um, you can see the other video that I did as to why, and part of it is so I can play a fantasy-based game with my daughter that will really appeal to both of our liking of... Um, the storytelling and generating aspect of tabletop gaming. Um, with that said, she's already looking, and she likes the idea of big armies when <laughs> she sees all the models. Um, but I also know that she's really into the fictional aspect of it and the, you know, the, the story generating feel of playing some of these tabletop games. And so I think I've, I've um, probably said everything I've wanted to say um, stuff coming through my mind. I'm interested in everybody else's thoughts. Um, and yeah, you know, like, lastly, I would just say that just give 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 GW's release a chance. Um, I'm not, as much as I like Eldar Scrolls, I don't know what's going to happen when the next game is coming out for Eldar, um, for, for the uh, post-Skyrim. I don't know what they're going to do. Um, I wasn't that crazy about the Elder Scrolls Online, but at the end of the day, I'm not like going on a huge rampage on Bethsaida, you know, the company. I'm just going to wait and see what they produce and, and enjoy it when it comes out. I'd, I'd, I'd encourage folks to do the same, particularly if you have a long-standing um, you know, history and, and liking of the game, to, all, to just really give it a chance and, um, and wait until you see what actually comes out before getting upset about any of the rumors or anything like that that you see. And then hopefully, maybe um, maybe some of my perspectives, if you were really against the skirmish aspect of it, will just kind of give you just another perspective on top of everybody else's to, to consider. So, as to the value of perhaps skirmish within the Warhammer Fantasy game. Okay, everybody, that was a long one, um, and I hope that everyone had a great Father's Day that is a father and also not a father, but just enjoying the day with your dad, potentially. So, okay, take care.